when my flesh becomes weak is then I can speak to the Savior who's with me each day. Oh, Father, forgive me, hear my plea, and He washes my sin away. Each time that I bow to give Him thanks for removing my guilt and shame, talking about for his answer is always the same what sins are you talking about I don't remember them anymore from the book of life they've all been torn out I don't remember them anymore. Amen. Good evening. Good to see you in the Lord's house tonight. I, it got better as we got closer to starting up. I, I, I knew we were going to be a little thin tonight because I know of several people that could not be here this evening. We're going to be away and out of town or different situations. And so... Uh, when I walked in, about two minutes till time to start, it was about half what it is right now. So uh, it got better, and uh, thank the Lord for that. But when we got a lot of folks out, that means that that uh, that that we need you to sing a little louder, right? Regardless of what your spouse says, go ahead and sing a little louder, even if they tell you not to. Tell them the pastor said that God wants you to sing louder tonight. Uh, and uh, and you got to pray harder, too, because there's not as many of us. So uh, we got to we gotta step up, as they say tonight, uh, with some folks out this evening. But we want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to meet needs and help tonight. Uh, we've, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go into detail a little bit more in our prayer time tonight. We've got a lot of our church family that are struggling right now. Certainly the Herring family is uh, first and foremost, I think, in our minds this week and the great difficulty they've been through uh, and continue to go through. So we want to ask the Lord's help for them and many others tonight. So right now, let's just start off by asking the Lord to bless our service and then Brother Michael come and give us our missions report. Father, we love you and thank you for the time that we have together this evening. Uh, you're a great God and we love you and we thank you uh, Lord sometimes things happen around us that we just really don't understand and that even dismay us a little bit Lord because we're not we're not fi we're, we're finite we are not infinite like you you know the end the, the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning and Lord it seems like all we can see is what's right in front of our face and that's really confusing sometimes and Lord, I pray that tonight that you'll lift our vision a little higher than that and help us to see in you that, that you are greater and bigger than all those things around us that are right up in our face that we don't understand or, or know about. And we pray that you'll help tonight. I pray that you'll be with the church family as many are struggling right now. Some are away. pray that you'll bring us all back safely together. Uh, some are facing and continuing to go through health problems. Uh, some in the middle of them, some coming out of them, some heading into them. I pray that you'll meet those needs tonight. And uh, Lord, I pray for our young people over in the Family Life Center this evening that you'll bless them. I believe Wes is standing in for Brother Brandon tonight as he's still with his wife as they came home from the hospital today. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'll bless uh, the workers with our master clubs over there. And Lord, I pray that this whole service will redound to the glory of God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated, Brother Mike. Okay, our missionary this week is Randy and Jeanette Alderman. Uh, their field address is Togo, West Africa, and their sending church is Trinity Baptist Church out of Jacksonville, Florida. Mission board is Baptist International Missions Incorporated, BIMI, B -I -M -I. and this month we started supporting them 14 years ago. 14 years ago they've been our missionaries, but they went to the field 31 years ago as missionaries. Wow. What a blessing. Yes. Uh, I apologize for the, uh, the bottom of the letter because of the pictures. It's a little bit difficult to, under, uh, to read all the, the print. Uh, but this, um, this letter is about a man called by God. And I encourage you to read the fascinating story 
of Pastor Philip. Now, the entire letter concerns this man. And uh, I won't hit any highlights at all except the fact that um, uh, you'll find out while you read the letter exactly where they planted a church in a place that nobody thought was a good idea, but you can see the, the hand of God, and uh, God knew exactly what he was doing. And when I was reading the letter, um, it reminded me the early days of Sumter Baptist Temple. Uh, in the early 1980s, uh, many of us came here, with the exception, I think it was the, the Ginthers and Ellen Calloway. Um, I think the rest of us came in the early, early 80s. And I can remember looking at this building and we'd come in here and we'd, nothing. And the excitement that we would have uh, knowing that um, God was going to um, allow us to build, uh, I mean, construct a larger auditorium. And the reason I say that is because uh, just a number of years ago, there was praying, the uh, people there in Togo was praying about a, a larger uh, congregational meeting. And that building is in, uh, I take it, is in, the, um, in place right now and uh, averaging over 100 people. So uh, the excitement was there. We, uh, we, we was excited. You had to be here, uh, brothers and sisters, to uh, feel exactly what we was going through. I, I won't take a, a, a chance by reading all the names that I think was here, but... Um, uh, because I, I might leave someone out. But let's pray for Pastor Philip. Uh, I believe you'll find it a fascinating uh, story about how God um, used someone that um, uh, probably uh, man would never uh, select it. But, but God says, I want this man. So um, Pastor Philip accepted the call. Uh, let's pray for the Taylors and Alaska, their physical conditions. I take it that the Stips are back in Spain and the Joneses in the Air Force. And remember, pray for the Alderman family. Amen. I had noticed there at the bottom of the letter that picture on the right there, they filled up that building that Brother Mike was talking about that they had prayed for before, and they're having to start another one. They're pouring the footers there uh, and uh, out there uh, doing that kind of work. I, uh, and to some degree, I miss the days when we could do that a little better uh, than we can now. Uh, it was uh, I have sweet memories of being involved in building a church building, even as a teenager uh, in a new church. Now they've, they've gotten codes to the point, and engineering and everything and you know you, you just you about have to have somebody build it but uh they uh what a blessing to see them investing uh in the in the work there uh and it is ama an amazing story there with pastor philip i just read the first little bit of it there brother mike and i could tell uh, where that was heading praise the lord for that all right let me go ahead and uh, get our our prayer list tonight and uh, do you need one anybody need one that hasn't gotten one yet i know the guys do a good job as you come in getting those passed out and I think that's the case here tonight. So let me mention a few things to you tonight, and we'll uh, ask the Lord to meet some needs here. Um, pray, if you would, for Miss Betty Ginther. She has a couple of procedures coming up on May 29th, I believe. So pray for her as she has uh, those health procedures coming up. Uh, had a, uh, and uh, uh, pray, uh, pray also for, um, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Herring family. Their own health needs, the the loss of their daughter, and uh, and I know for a fact, for other reasons, that they had a very hard day today. Spent some time with them this afternoon, had a hard day today. They've just got a lot going on in their lives right now, and they just really need the Lord's help uh, and encouragement. And I hope that you'll pray for them, lift them up every single day, lift them up several times a day as you think of them, and ask the Lord to give them the strength that they need this week. Uh, very, very tough circumstances. And, of course, their daughter Kim is listed there as well uh, with her health. She has a, a heart problem, and a lot of most everything that is stressing the herrings right now is stressing her as well. Uh, and uh, we all know what that does for a heart condition. So uh, pray for her as well uh, right now uh, and ask for the Lord's uh, help there. Uh, 
Pray for Miss Ann as she goes tomorrow for her heart calf uh, tomorrow morning, uh, and I hope that you'll lift her up. Let's pray specifically that whatever blockage they may find, the doctor seems confident that there is blockage there, whatever blockage they may find will be able to be treated in the cath lab, that they can stent it and get blood flowing and be able to get, get her back underway without anything too invasive having to be done. So let's just pray very much toward that. Uh, I believe she'd love to miss surgery. I think all of us would love for her to miss surgery. So we're going to pray for uh, the, 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 them to be able to either treat with medication or stent, whatever uh, may be there, uh, and, uh, uh, or just ask the Lord to clean it out of there. Amen. That'll work too. We, we'll, we'll pray that way also. So uh, just pray that the Lord would work in her behalf. I uh, just wanted to say a, a hello to the church family from Fred and Lori Levi. Had a had a tremendous visit uh, with them last night and had a real good time. Uh, and uh, they, uh, I I know they're I know they're probably watching tonight. Uh, and I don't care what Brother Fred tells you, I did not eat his donut. I didn't do it. He tries to get me to every time I go, but I didn't eat his donut. Uh, he told me he's going to save one for the next time I came, and I believe that. But I told him before I come next time, I'm going to run at least three miles and not eat breakfast, and I'm going to come and eat his donut that he's got saved for me. And then I'm going to steal another one because there's always a pack of them on the counter over there. I'm going to take one. Well, I'm going to get take the one he gives me and steal another one. But anyway, they they said to give you their best wishes and uh, say hello to you. Continue to pray for them as their uh, the neuropathy is really giving Brother Fred the Dickens right now. He's having a very hard time. Hope that you'll continue to pray for him. Of course, we ask you to continue to pray uh, for the Whitakers. Uh, but the TJ is back at the nursing home here in Sumter. Uh, of course, got a bad report uh, on his uh, test that they did, and they found uh, gross that the doctor, uh, uh, he's not seen an oncologist yet, I don't believe, but the doctor believes him to be colon cancer. And, uh, of course, Miss Mary is, uh, is headed toward a heart catheterization herself because the doctor uh, feels like there are blockages there. Uh, so uh, be praying, if you would, uh, for her. Um, also pray for Dale Wyckoff. Dale has been having a real problem with uh, a hip uh, and uh, was supposed to see the doctor, I think, this week. They're supposed to see the orthopedist about that. Uh, I haven't heard any updates from them, so uh, do be praying uh, for Brother Dale as well. Um, those are some in our church family. Uh, there are several uh, that, are, uh, that are listed here. Some of these were new last week. Ellen Cooper that had an abscess on her leg that Elaine Miller asked us to pray for uh, the both the uh, Mathis family and the Tennant family and the loss of loved ones recently uh, Stacy McGill who recently had a stroke all these are under our friends list over there Carlton Rhodes with lung cancer um, and Earl Wiggins uh, with cancer as well and uh, Miss Jean I believe you had a nephew that passed away. I believe I saw that on Facebook late today. Is that right? Steve Slimp. Amen. 
That's right. And in case you couldn't hear that, uh, that's the Steve Slimp family. And Juanita is his mother, right? That's your sister. Uh, and, uh, the, and we have her name incorrect. We'll fix it. She's listed as Juanita Slim up in the, our loved ones list, uh, but we'll, we'll change that to Slimp. Uh, and you'll notice beside her name there, and as she was saying, this is the case with that entire family, is that they do not know the Lord. And we need to pray that the Lord will soften those hearts during this time of, of grief and shock of seeing someone taken so quickly. Let's just pray that the Lord will work um, in their lives and that, that they will, they will start, begin to look to Jesus. Certainly be praying for them. Yes, ma'am. We'll continue to lift them up. The Steve Slimp family. Who else tonight? Yes, ma'am. Mm. I pray for Miss Linda. She's got an unspoken request, and also her the the cloudiness has returned to the eye, one of the eyes that they recently did the cataract surgery on. So, um, with we would expect that to be cleared up and done by now. So she, she's going back to the doctor. Pray about that as well, Brother Lee. Amen. So he says we can cross Miss Sarah Bryan off the list. She's doing well. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Elaine? Mm-hmm. Okay. Amen. We're glad to hear she's doing better. That's Ellen Cooper. That 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 that's moving in the right direction and doing well now. So, Earl Wiggins, yeah. And that and who was the first name you mentioned? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, I got you. Also, of course, pray for um, uh, Jessica Lynch and little Bailey. Uh, that things will continue to go well. Uh, they were headed home from the, hosp from, uh, from the hospital today. Uh, had a very, very busy afternoon, and I just have not had a chance to contact them this afternoon, but I assume that they're at home and doing well. Um, earlier today, Brother Brandon said he planned to be back in the office tomorrow. I imagine he would not be doing that if things were not going very well. Now, it's their first night at home. We'll see if he's still as excited about that tomorrow morning as he is today, but... Uh, Right now, he's planning on being here tomorrow. I'm going to be looking for you, Brother Brandon. We'll see. Amen. Mm-hmm. Good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Do we have him on here? Give me his name again. The 
he has what on top of that? Walmans. Okay. Amen. We can certainly relate to that with our grandson. I know what that is when they can't get nourishment. Right. Okay. How old is he now? Okay. It will be. I think what I think yeah, I think what happened before is that he may have accidentally got put on the friends list because if they get put on the friends list after four or five weeks, if we don't hear more information, they rotate off. And I think he was mistakenly put on the friends list instead of the family list. But we'll get him on there. I've got it written down and he'll he'll stay on there until until you say otherwise then. Sure. You, know, you you may not have been able to hear all that. That's uh, Aiden Abernathy, their grandson, has cystic fibrosis and Wallman's disease, and just has spent so much time in the hospital and still is not well uh, and has a lot of struggles, uh, having some of the same feeding issues and so forth that we've experienced uh, as well. Uh, and so, if you would, with Devin, so if you would, just uh, pray for uh, Aiden as well. We'll get him at it. Right. Right. And then when they can't even take it through the feeding tube, it gets kind of scary when that stuff starts. Anybody else? All righty. Like I said earlier, you got to pray hard tonight. Not as many of us. So we'll come and gather around uh, as you come. I pray for Cindy Shelton as well, and uh, as they'll be uh, traveling back um, from California later this week, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she flew out before the baby got here. She had to go to her daughter's to Kristen's graduation, and so she's not gotten to see the baby in person yet. I don't, I don't guess. So uh, I don't know when they fly back. If it's uh, tomorrow or Friday, I'm not sure what day. What, mom? They fly back tonight. So pray for traveling mercies for them as they fly back. So let's go ahead and come and we'll pray. If you're able to, come and join us at the altar, around the altar here in the front, and we'll take these things to the Lord. Brother Mike, I'll let you start us off, and if you would please specifically pray for our missionaries tonight uh, so we make sure that we get them uh, included here in our prayer time this evening. Brother Suggs, if you'd come behind him, that would be a blessing. And Brother Ricky, if you'll come behind Brother Suggs and close out our prayer time.
Um, Brother Ricky uh, mentioned uh, the um, the Riley's uh, uh, newest edition. We've got a song, fellas. The before we do the offering, we still got one song. Sometimes we don't have time for it, but tonight we do. Uh, so y'all, I'll let him come ahead. Um, but he mentioned the Riley's newest edition. They uh, they did have a little a bit of a scare this week. Had to take her to the hospital with some breathing difficulties, and then they sent her on to uh, Columbia, the Children's Hospital over there. They checked her out there, and they're chalking it up to some uh, some pretty uh, some pretty uh, pretty bad case of. Uh, um, reflux uh, that, that was causing the symptoms that they were seeing. Uh, they tested her for a lot of other things that uh, that that didn't um, that that showed up negative. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, but uh, uh, do pray for her that they can get that uh, rectified, where she doesn't have those kind of episodes anymore. All right, brother, lead us another song. All right, let's stand. We'll sing one verse of 166, and then we'll shake hands. 166. <laughs> Give of your best to the Master Give of the strength of your youth Throw your soul's fresh glowing ardor Into the battle for truth Jesus has set the example Dauntless was he young and brave Give him your loyal devotion. Give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Clad in salvations for armor. Join in the battle for truth. Shake hands.
verse 2 of 166. I'm sorry, verse 3. <laughs> Give of your best to the master. Naught else is worthy his love. He gave himself for your ransom, gave up his glory above, lay down his life without murmur, you from sin's ruin to save. Give him your heart's adoration, give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Glad in salvation's full armor. Join in the battle for truth. You can be seated. Ushers, get ready for the offering tonight. We'll have prayer and ask for the Lord's blessing on it. Brother Lee, if you will lead us, sir. Thank you, Miss Janie. Appreciate you playing for us tonight. Take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 119, of course, and we'll continue in our series there tonight. And when we look at these different eight verse sections of Psalm 119, uh, you all know that uh, they uh, are written in acrostic fashion, uh, where the first letter uh, is uh, uh, of of the as the as the the sections begin. The first letter of each section is a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet, um, and that typically doesn't mean a lot to you, uh, I would say, as for, because you don't know Hebrew. So um, and I and by the way, don't take that wrong. I don't either. I studied Greek, but I did not study Hebrew. Uh, after I after I got done with Greek, I did not have much desire to study Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew being more difficult than Greek, and Greek wore me out. Uh, but uh, in in Hebrew, you know, we see these characters, or, and really, what you're seeing is the uh, is the the English pronouncement uh, of it, uh, what we call a transliteration where English characters are used to form a, to show you a similar sound to what the Hebrew character, uh, how it would be sounded out. Uh, and most of those are not anything that you relate to much, uh, just as a lot of the Greek characters uh, uh, don't. If I, if I mention sigma or tau or upsilon tonight uh, in Greek, those wouldn't mean a lot to you. But if I mentioned alpha or omega, those would mean something to you because you're familiar with them from Scripture. Most of you probably I know those are the first and the last letters of the of the Greek alphabet, and our Savior is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
Well, you may not know it, but you also know this Hebrew character tonight. If you come with me to chapter 73, if your Bible has the, the, the Hebrew letter uh, that is the part of the acrostic for this section, uh, yours may say J-O-D. Is that what yours says? Some, some of them may something different. Does anybody say something different than J-O-D? It may be a little, some, I've seen another way of it being written. Uh, you and I would look at that as jawed. Anybody got an idea of how we ought to relate to that? The jot, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, Jesus pointed out uh, that, uh, that, that uh, heaven and earth may pass away, but, uh, but his word would not pass away, uh, not, and, that, and that, uh, that, uh, not until one jot or tittle had all been fulfilled. Uh, the, the, the jot is the jod that you see here. Uh, and it is significant because it is also the smallest of the Hebrew characters. Uh, and then the tittle is a, a point of punctuation. It is a punctuation mark. And what Jesus was saying is not the least little bit of God's word is going to go unfulfilled. Right down to the smallest point of punctuation or the smallest letter of the alphabet, uh, Jesus was saying God's word is true and is going to be fulfilled and is going to come to pass. Well, this is the jot that he was referring to tonight that is the heading of this, psalm, uh, of this section of Psalm 119. And I want you to notice tonight that in Psalm 119, we'll be beginning in verse 73, the Bible says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me, uh, give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. And then he says something in seven, verse 74 that sort of sets a tone that reveals itself later on in this section as well uh, and will sort of be our theme tonight. He says, They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. Uh, he makes a definite reference here to the fact that other people will be influenced because of his relationship to the Word of God. And we're going to see that principle come up elsewhere uh, in, the, in these eight verses tonight. Uh, I'll tell you what I considered as we were coming in here, and obviously the Lord has sort of given us a theme and a lens through which to view all of these truths about the Word of God as we go through uh, Psalm 119. And, and I, 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 will know, I will tell you that I, I seized on a word for a moment in verse 74. Uh, they that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. Word, and I just preached about hope on Sunday night and I, I started to run with that and then I realized that a few weeks ago I preached on another passage uh, and uh, 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 about the word of God here in Psalm 119 and I believe the title was a word that brings hope <laughs> and so I, I, I looked a little closer and as I did I noticed this this theme that goes through the eight verses really uh, about the how God's word is working in his life and that has an effect on others or it, or it gives him an influence in the lives of other people. And tonight I want to speak to you on the subject, a word that influences. A word that influences. Here's the basic premise tonight, and this psalm is going to bear it out. If you will give yourself to the study of the Word of God, to the memorization of the Word of God, and perhaps even more important, the obedience of the Word of God. If you get into this book and let this book get into you, because if it gets into you, what will happen? It will come out of you in your actions, in your words, in the things you say and do. If you'll get in the Word and let the Word get into you and consequently it will start coming out of you, it will bring about this, that God will allow your life touched by the Word of God to influence the lives of other people. Now I want to say this to you tonight, that, that if we do not influence the lives of other people, we are wasting space on God's earth. We really are. Because what else can you do that's going to matter for eternity? 
You say, well, I am here to bring glory to the Lord. Well, you surely are, but I got news for you. One day around the throne of God, you'll bring glory to Him like you've never been able to do it down here in a sinless body with, that, uh, with, with, with no limitations. My goodness, you, you'll sing better than the angels because you have a song to sing that no angel can sing. And you'll do a much better job of giving glory to him there. So why am I here? Why has God left me here? You say, well, the, the, the doctrinal proof text answer is this. I'm here to bring glory to God. Again, I will bring glory to him in heaven. But you know what I can do here that I will not be able to do in heaven? You've got a few short years on this earth. I, uh, Charlotte yesterday, I didn't realize it until I got to the funeral home yesterday. I had sort of missed it. Uh, she, she, she passed away several days short of her 50th birthday. I believe I totaled it up and she was 28 months older than I when she passed away. Uh, and, and that was a sobering thought for me uh, as, a, as a man middle-aged uh, to, uh, to bury someone who was so close to my own age. But, but I, I want to I tell you tonight that, that we don't know how long we've got down here. I posted on the, the verse on my Facebook today that our, the scripture talks about our days being three score and ten. Not everybody makes it to three score and ten, but many do. And some make it beyond. But even if you do, you really have but a short few years to serve the Lord down here comparative to the eons of eternity and in the eons of eternity you will not be able to do this one thing that you can do down here on this short journey of life right now and that is influence people for God. You can influence lost people to be saved. You can influence saved people to live for God so that they are better equipped and they have the power of God on their life so that they can reach lost people as well. There's a lot of ways in which our influence impacts thing, uh, people for eternity and we can't do it after this life is over. We can only do it now. And if you get in the Word, let the Word get in you, and then watch God bring it out of you in your life, in your actions, in your words, and the way you live your life, God is going to use that to influence people. Now, here's what I don't believe we should do, just to check this for a moment. I, I don't believe that we should have spiritual ambition. What I mean by that is this. I've been around some people before that they seemed far too inf interested in expanding their own influence by their own methods, okay? I believe you ought to steward your influence, but I shouldn't have the mentality that I want to build a name or an influence or a testimony for myself. I don't believe that's right. Here's what I do believe. I believe if you will be obedient to God, God's word will work in you, through you, and out of you, and God will determine and decide and give you influence in the other people's lives. Man knows how to manufacture that which is artificial and looks to be but is not quite real. God grows in us what is real and what is genuine. And what we want is not a manufactured influence that is stained with the sinfulness of man's methodology. We want an influence that comes from the inside out that is grown in and out of us by God through his word and through his Holy Spirit, inspiring his word. So I want you to notice here tonight we're talking about a word that influences. I want you to notice first of all in the passage tonight in the first few verses we're going to see an influence that produces admiration. An influence that produces admiration. God is going to use his word to grow your influence and that influence is going to bring some level of admiration. Notice how and why. In verse 73 he says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. I want you to know first of all that God's in, that the word is going to bring influence in your life that produces admiration based on ownership. There in verse 73. It's based on ownership. What did he say? Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. God knows what he's doing. God made you. God, God knew what he wanted you to be like. 
Some of you wanted to be four inches taller. Some of you wish you were a few inches shorter. So, some, uh, I, I've, I've, been around, I, I've been around folks, if they got curly hair, they want straight hair. If they got straight hair, they want curly hair. You know what I'm talking about? The simple fact of the matter is, God knew exactly what he wanted you to be when he made you. And God knows what he's doing, amen? amen. And what God designs works. We've got a lot of people today that are saying, hey, married people are getting, are getting uh, uh, divorced at a pretty high rate too. Uh, uh, I mean, saved people are getting divorced at a pretty high rate too, so maybe this whole marriage thing's just overblown. Uh, as if God made a mistake when he created marriage. Marriage is the institution of God. God created it, and I want to tell you this. Marriage works amen. when you do it God's way. But when you do it man's way and when you don't obey God's word and you try to do it your own way instead of God's way, it doesn't work. But it's not because marriage is broke. It's because I'm broke. It's because somebody else is broke if it's not working. Uh, but marriage is God's idea. God's ideas work. You know, God made you. And yes, I know sin has brought some awful things into our lives. Uh, but I'm going to tell you this. When we, when, we can, when we get saved and then we live a life that uh, Dr. Comfort used to teach us, he said, keep short accounts of, uh, with God. He said, sin affects our fellowship with the Lord. So he said, don't keep long accounts with the Lord. Keep current. He said when he first got saved, he had grown up Catholic, so he thought he had to wait till Sunday to go to church and go to the altar and confess all of his sin. He said it was a happy day in my life when I found out that I didn't have to live out of fellowship with God all week long. If I failed, I could call on the Lord and, and I could confess my sin and he would forgive me on the spot. And, and he, he said, you know, it was, it was a blessing to be able to know that I could keep a, a short account with God. But here's the thing. If I'm saved and I'm keeping short accounts with the Lord, I'm not letting sin interfere with this in my life. Uh, I, can, I can be used of God. And, and, and God has created something fashioned by his own design. Yes, tainted by sin now, but fashioned by his own design. What I'm saying is God's got a plan for your life and God's plan works and you'll work in that place God has for you if you'll find it and, and, he, and notice he says that this whole deal about people being influenced by him is based on ownership he says thy hands have made me and fashioned me and then notice this he says give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments so here we go God made me and if I plug myself into, as a person that God made, if I plug myself into his word, this thing works. You're not made to work outside the word of God and its principles. You say, so-and-so's a mess. Well, of course they are. They're made to be a mess without God in their lives. You're not made to work well without him. You're created in the image of God. How could you work well and how could your life work well without him and his word? It can't. So when I, when I as the creation of God get plugged into the word of God, he says, give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Verse 74, they that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in my word. When we do verse 73, verse 74 is going to happen. So it's an influence that, it, that, that produces admiration. Well, that, that admiration and that influence is based on ownership. The reason he's interested in the word of God is he knows where he came from. He knows who he belongs to. I know whom I believe. I am not only the created being of God, created in his image, but I was bought back from the slave market of sin. I am the property of God Almighty. He owns me. And then notice it is not only based on ownership, but it is based on hope. Notice verse 74. They that fear me will be glad when they see me. Why? Why? Because I have hoped in thy word. When I hope in the word of God, when my hope is built on the word of God, I'm going to invest myself in the word of God. And when I invest my life in the word of God, God does some good things in my life and others will notice that. Now listen, don't ever, don't ever pretend to serve God or to try to grow in the Lord because you are thirsty for the praise of people. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about, not all what I'm talking about here. But I'm going to tell you what, it is a blessing 
when somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'd been struggling in this area of my life or I was just really having a hard time, but I've been watching what God's doing in your life and it encouraged me to go on for the Lord. Or, or maybe a prayer that you prayed really revealed something to me. I had, a, I had a preacher friend tell me. He said, I heard a 70 some odd year old preacher the other day he told me the man's name. He said, I was with him in a service and, and we had a prayer meeting and he said he got on his face before the Lord and I heard that man well into his 70s pray and say, oh God, my heart is so wicked. And my flesh is so weak. This is a man who is very highly thought of by his peers and by, the, by those that know him. But my preacher friend heard his preacher friend say, God, my heart is so wicked and my flesh is so weak as he poured his heart out before the Lord. You know what he told me? He said, he said Mike, that made an impression on me. That made an impression on me. You know what? The, that man did not decide on his own that his heart is wicked and his flesh is weak. Where did he find that out? Word of God. Spirit of God. Taking the Word of God and applying it to his life. Well, what comes out of him then makes an impression on my friend. There is influence that comes into this brother's life. Why? Because someone else has hoped in the Word of God, has invested themselves in the Word of God, has spent time in the Word of God. God's Word has done its work in his life, and this person is influenced by it because this brother has hoped in the word of God it's based on ownership it's based on hope and it's based on experience now before I explain based on experience I want to tell you this you can look this way for just a moment I remember when I was a younger man and I was pastoring and I didn't have what they called experienced experience I, I was wet behind the ears I didn't know what I was doing I remember the first time a church member looked at me not impressed with the decision I'd made or what I was doing. And I'll be honest with you, in retrospect, I don't know now. I don't remember what it was. Don't remember if I, you know, sometimes you look at things different years later. I don't know what it was. I don't remember what it was. Don't know if I was right. Don't know if I was wrong. But I remember the first time he looked at me and said, with his very pure South Carolina Midlands accent, Pastor, this is your first church. In other words, that was a nice way of saying, Preacher, you really don't know what you're doing. That's what he was saying. And because I'm older than you, I'm right and you're wrong. Because I didn't have any experience. And, and I, remember, I remember those years. Well, now I've been pastoring over 20 years. And I have what is called experience. And Brother Suggs, I'm going to tell you this. Experience is highly overrated experience sort of stinks a lot of times experience usually means you've got some battle scars amen? amen experience means those of you who are more experienced than I at life you can testify tonight that experience don't doesn't always mean good things amen, amen. you with me experience sometimes just means that stuff doesn't work anymore Experience is highly overrated. With that in mind, I want you to come to verse 75. This influence that produces the admiration of others, not of you, but of what God is doing in your life. It is based also on experience. Notice verse 75. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hath, what's that next word? Afflicted me now last week we saw a reference similar to this in verse 67 where he said before I was afflicted I went astray but now have I kept thy word and in that case we could pretty well say that the affliction was the chastisement of God based on the fact that he had went astray from the word of God before I was afflicted I went astray I went astray then what happened I was afflicted and he comes back later and, 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 and affirms that it was a good thing for him that that happened. Now, I am not going to say tonight that I know for sure what the affliction here is. 
There are a number of things that it could be. It could still be the chastening hand of God in one's life. It could be that God is working in us both to do and to will of His good pleasure. It may be that God knows that there are some lessons in our life that we're not going to learn any other way. It may mean that there are lessons that others will learn from our life because of the afflictions, the hardships, the tough times that we go through. It may be that God is now working in us something that only feels like pain and difficulty that God is going to use in years to come to take off some of our rough edges and to make us a vessel for the finer and make us more ready for the master's use. I've had many people many times years ago especially ask you know what did I learn from or what did I think God was accomplishing in our lives when Nathan went to heaven I don't know the answer to that I'm not God I chose to leave that in God's hands but I will tell you this by observation here's something I know I was still a pretty young guy, pretty young guy back then I, I, was, I, I still had a lot to learn I was still in my first church it was only about halfway through my time there. And, and I can tell you this, I wanted to help people. I wanted to love people. I wanted to have grace and compassion when they went through hardships in life. I was still young enough that I wanted to know the perfect thing to say when they were suffering and struggling that would help them and lift them out of it because I was not experienced. And I learned a lot of things going through that. I don't know that I can say I know the reason that all that happened. I'm not God, as I said earlier. But I do know this. I know I learned some lessons through that that I don't think I would have probably learned any other way. And God allowed me to be able, I hope and pray, I trust, to be able to encourage and comfort and help others in their struggle in a way that I wouldn't have known how to. The first thing I learned was to quit trying to find that perfect thing to say. When you look for that perfect thing to say, you are in the slow motion process of reaching your foot up where you don't think it will reach all the way to your mouth and you're about to swallow it whole. And some people never learn that. The best thing you can say to somebody in a time like that, I don't mean to get off track, is just love them and tell them, I'm so sorry and I love you. I can't fix it, but I love you and I'm here. That means more to them than any, any flowery words you can say. And I had a lot to learn in that area. Now, hey, I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes experience is no fun. Sometimes experience is hard. Sometimes experience is affliction. But here's what I learned from this, and that may cast a dark cloud over what has been an otherwise positive subject for you up till now, but it shouldn't because I want you to notice, he says, and that thou in thy faithfulness hath afflicted me. The world goes through troubles and trials and gain nothing from it because they know not God. And the God that would love to work in them both to will and to do of their good pleasure will not and cannot because they are rejecting Him and they have not the Spirit of God. But I have this promise. I go through no affliction as a Christian that God is not working for my good in the midst of it. Even in my chastisement, God is working for my good. In every hardship, God is working in me. He's working on me. And there is a purpose and a reason. I tell people all the time, don't waste your trial. Learn all that God will teach you. Don't you waste it because God won't. 
God's got, a, God's got some things he wants to do. We get so caught up in looking for that one answer. What's the reason that this is going on? It's sometimes not one silver bullet reason. It's several things that God is doing in your life that you don't see and that you don't know about. And God may be doing it in your life for somebody else's benefit so that you can influence them. And when that affliction came into his life, whatever it was, and whether it was because of, of sinfulness or whether it was just God trying him and bringing him forth as gold that experience brought an admiration from others who looked at him because when they saw what God was doing they were impressed with that I'm going to tell you this the people that I have the most respect for in my life are not the ones who preach to the biggest crowds although I have respect for a lot of those guys the people that I respect the most quite frankly Many of them never step behind a pulpit. I'm going to tell you some of the people that I have admired most in my life and I continue to are the suffering saints of God who are faithful to Him and praise Him and serve Him even in the midst of their great suffering and difficulty and the trying of their life and of their faith. Oh, they have great influence on my life. They really do. An influence that produces admiration. Very quickly, notice secondly tonight, an influence that is aided by God's goodness. One thing we have emphasized already in Psalm 119, God is good. Amen? Amen. And some of the testimony to that is coming to us in verse 76 and 77. Let I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. I'm influ the, that influence in my life is aided by the goodness of God. I cannot become the Christian that God can use to influence others on my own. I need the goodness of God working in my life. And it's, it's a goodness that shows up as a kindness that is comforting my heart and life. Notice he says, let I pray, thy, I pr let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort. Now, stop and think about that. When I stop and think about that for a moment, and when I was studying, I, would, I was immediately taken in my mind back to Psalm 27. Would you stick your finger there in 119 and turn back to Psalm 27? I want to show you one verse real quick. Psalm 27. He said here in Psalm 119, Let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort. If you'll allow me a moment to equate the kindness of God to the goodness of God, I don't think we're going to do any great harm there theologically equating those two. I want you to notice what he says in Psalm 27 and verse 13. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now... Notice he said, believe to see. Now here's what we know in the, in the New Testament. If we can equate belief and faith, and they, they are essentially one and the same, the Bible tells us that we walk by faith, not by? So faith is not necessarily seeing, and seeing is not faith. If I can see it, I don't have to believe in it. It is there in front of me. Uh, we, we, are, we are blessed according to the Scriptures. We say we would have liked to have lived in the time of Christ where we could see Him. The Scriptures tell us that we are blessed to live in the day that we do live in because it is a greater thing, the Scripture says, for us to believe Him having not seen Him. But it says here that I, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. He believed to see it. Don't miss it. He's not saying that I got to see the goodness of God in the land of the living the way I expected to. He said I believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. The, the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of, the, of things not seen. Faith is a belief that is so strong that we believe it as intently as if we had already seen it, although it is beyond uh, the, our ability to actually see with our own eyes and experience with our own senses. Yet we believe it as strongly as if we'd seen it our own selves. 
Now I want you to notice he said, I, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Come back to Psalm 119, let me ask you, where did he learn about the goodness of God in the land of the living? Where did he find out that he could expect at some point that the goodness of God would be made manifest in the land of the living? I believe to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Notice we, there uh, in, uh, in verse 76, once again, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for thy com my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. He believes to see the goodness of God according to the word of God. He is praying for the kindness of God to bring comfort into his life. Why? Because he has seen in the word of God that that is available and God has made promises to him and he's claiming those promises. I'm saying to you that there is an influence that is aided by the goodness of God when we, by faith, trust in the promises of God's word about his goodness. Remember we said it a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, that sometimes in your life, it may have just been last week, sometimes in your life, things aren't going to look good right around you. You're going to have to accept on the basis of faith that God is good. I believe to see on the pages in the word of God, the goodness of God in the land of the living, in this world that we live in around us, it doesn't always look good and it doesn't always look like the right side's win and it doesn't always look like things are going to turn out the way we want them to. We have to believe to see the goodness of God sometimes according to and based on, as he said, the word, thy word unto thy servant. An influence that is aided by God's goodness. We see it in the kindness that comforts us and helps us to go forward for the Lord. And we see it in, see it in the mercy that it takes to live in this world and to live for God. Notice verse 77. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live, for thy, my, thy law is my light. I want you to notice he doesn't say let thy tender mercies come unto me so that I can be blessed or so that things will go well or so that I can prosper. He says let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live. It reminds me of what Lamentations chapter 3 says. Perhaps you know what I'm talking about tonight. Where the Bible tells us in Lamentations chapter 3 that it is of the Lord's mercies. And I will say this, it is only of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Uh, that because his passions fail not, uh, his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Without the mercy of God, I'd be consumed. Without the mercy of God, I couldn't even live. His holiness would destroy me. His holiness couldn't stand the sight of me. Were it not for the mercies of God, I would be swept away not only by my own sin, but by the attacks of Satan and by his forces in this world. It is only of the mercy of God that you and I are not wiped out every day that we live. It is only the mercy of God that allows us to even live. Don't you think the devil would kill you if God would let him I mean, really, you're that mark. God, he hates God. He hates his children. And he'd kill you, but he'd do it slowly and painfully. Because he's just he just loves that. The devil's a murderer from the beginning. He's a bloodthirsty scoundrel. And there's no degree of suffering he wouldn't inflict on you on, your, on his way to killing you. He'd destroy every one of us if God would let him. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. And when we live our life based on faith in those principles, believing in the kindness that God comforts, even though sometimes around us we don't see all the evidence of it that we want, but we do see it in the Word of God. And the mercy that we need to live comes from God. Notice he says, Let thy uh, I pray thee, mer uh, I'm sorry, verse 77, Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live for thy law is my delight. He says, I delight in the law of the Lord. I read about the mercies of God and by his word, the mercies of God throw, flow through my life every 
single day. An influence that produces admiration. An influence that is aided by God's goodness. And unfortunately, I have to tell you real quickly tonight that it's an influence that is assailed by the proud. Notice, if you will, verse 78. Let the proud be ashamed, for they have dealt perversely with me without a cause. But I will meditate in thy precepts. It's an influence that's assailed. Hey, God will, through his word, work in your life, and he'll do some things in your life that'll cause some people to look at your life and, and respect it and even want to emulate some of that and, and just appreciate God doing his work in your life. But there are others that are going to hate the fact that God is working in your life. Understand this. Darkness always despises the light. We have eyes that adjust to the light and the darkness. And, and it, it is not welcome in the midst of darkness for somebody to suddenly without warning shine a one million candle power light in your eyes. You're like, oh, wait, what? Get that away from me. Turn that off. What are you doing to me? Because our eyes have become accustomed to the darkness. And it is even painful for us to view that kind of light. And darkness always flees in the presence of light. And darkness always wars against the light. And I know it's not fair, but we're reminded here from the scriptures that sometimes we are going to be assailed because of our faith. I see it all the time. Just in recent days, I have seen Christians that I know are being attacked and are being assailed ruthlessly and mercilessly just because their light offends the darkness that is nearby them. You say, well, pastor, that's disappointing. <laughs> That's discouraging. It's Wednesday night. I need you to encourage me. I will offer you some encouragement. Thank God that His Word has produced a left light in your life for it to be despised. Because without the Word of God and its perfect, per, uh, a perfect work in your life, you'd just blend in with the darkness. There wouldn't be anything to offend anyone. Sometimes you just have to stomp the old devil, uh, uh, devil's foot and stick your finger in his eye and say, do your worst, buddy. I'm just going to tell you this. I'm glad I've got the right enemies. I'm glad, that, I'm glad that it's the devil's crowd that hates me because it means some light must be shining. I heard a preacher say one time, he said, don't worry about the dead churches. The devil doesn't even come to hear those guys preach. You may have to think on that for it to catch up to you. But hey, if the devil is assailing, thank God there's some light that he despises. It's an influence that produces an admiration and is aided by God's goodness and it is assailed by those who are proud. But thank God he says, but I will meditate in thy precepts. When the wicked assail you and you're lied about and you're shot at and it hurts so badly... I want to encourage you to do this. Don't try to get back and get even or get out from under it even. Get deeper in the Word of God. Amen. There is where the help is. There is where the light is. Notice, if you will, lastly tonight, very quickly, and I must close, it's an influence that attracts attention. When you invest yourself in the Word of God and God's Word is in you and is coming out of you, it's going to attract attention. Notice verse 79. Let those that fear thee turn unto me and those that have known thy testimonies. Let them turn to me. I believe there's a, there's a couple of aspects of this. Let them turn to me that they might stand with me when I am assailed. It's a blessing to stand with a brother when he's being maligned. And you should. Don't you be a fair weather friend. Don't you be somebody that's got a friend until somebody says something bad about them and the first bad thing you hear about them you throw them under the bus. I've never understood some Christians. They, they, they'll, they'll thank God for a preacher and they'll trust their pastor to watch for their souls. But you let somebody in church come and say one bad thing about their pastor and as soon as they do, they're like, well, boy, that's disappointing. 
It's like they just believe it instantly. It boggles my mind. I see it happen to, to preachers all the time. I'm not saying that sometimes that preachers are above reproach because sometimes preachers do some pretty awful things because they're sinners, saved by grace, hopefully. But I'll tell you this, uh, when, when, when the, the wicked assail the righteous, we ought to stand with the righteous. Say amen and I'll quit. It's, all, it's time. We ought to stand with our brothers and sisters when they're falsely accused. Somebody wants to start coming and tell me, giving my brother or sister down the road, I've, I've had them come to my office with sheets full of paper, full of allegations. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm preaching right now, okay? I'm telling the truth. And want to sit in my office and read long lists of allegations against their brother or sister in Christ because they despise them so bad. They're basically telling me it's either me or them. You either run them off or I'm leaving. And I've just stopped them and said, hey, listen, my, they're not here to speak for themselves. You're not going to sit here in my office and gossip about your brother. There's a difference between having a real desire to solve a problem and just wanting to talk bad about somebody. I'm not going to listen to that stuff. Now, if we need to deal with it, we'll get them to come in here and sit down. You can say it to their face, amen. But I'm just saying that, that, that he, he, he points out here that he says, let those that fear turn unto me. Uh, why? But because it'll be a blessing for them to stand with me. And it'll also be a, it is also a blessing that, that iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth countenance of his friend. And when the word of God has its work in our life, God will turn the hearts of other believers toward us so that we might encourage them and help them. And our relationship will be mutually beneficial. We'll both sharpen each other's iron. And that it's so, so that influence that attracts attention it attracts the attention of those that serve God but it also attracts the attention of those that shame notice verse 80 let my heart be sound in thy statutes that I be not ashamed now here's the fact if God's word comes into your life and makes a difference and thereby others are attracted to seeing what God has done in your life and they appreciate it note, understand this that that puts you in a place where people are watching you for good or for bad. And the simple fact of the matter is there are some who are waiting for your failure so they can pounce on it. There are others that will forgive you and are looking for your good, but they'll still be disappointed and they'll struggle with the fact that we are not faithful to the word that we have said we believe. And so he, say, he says, Lord, help me to be deep in your word. Help me to be faithful in your word. Let, uh, let, uh, let my heart be sound in thy statutes that I be not ashamed so that I don't bring reproach upon the name and the person of Jesus Christ. This book is a book that not only influences your life, but will use your life to influence others. Let's get in it. And let's get it, let it get in us and come out of us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time tonight. I pray you'll bless the word of God and use it for your honor and glory and let your word have great influence in our life and on the lives of others as it comes through our lives. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming out tonight. You're dismissed.